at the Capitol. And it feels even better to be making history. I am honored to stand between Speaker Joe Tate and Majority Leader Winnie Briggs. Both of these leaders are firsts. The first black speaker and the first woman majority leader in Michigan history. They will certainly not be the last. So, Speaker Tate, Majority Leader Brinks, Minority Leader Hall, Minority Leader Nesbitt, I look forward to our partnership centered on problem solving. It's what the people of Michigan deserve. Now let's also take a moment to honor our Michigan State Police and our Michigan National Guard. They and their families make sacrifices to keep us all safe. We will always have their backs, and we mean it. We are calling on the Biden administration to keep supporting our Guard members, their families, and the community, and together to continue to base a fighter mission at Selfridge National Air Guard Base in Macomb County. And now I want to acknowledge our Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, Attorney General Dana Nessel, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. You have been strong allies and great friends. I'm looking forward to more good work together. And I also want to acknowledge our incredible state employees, my cabinet, my executive office staff, who work so hard to move our state forward. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you. <laughs> my fellow Michiganders, we spoke with a clear voice in November. We want the ability to raise a family without breaking the bank. We want strong protections for our fundamental rights to vote and control our own bodies. Leaders. Leaders who will work across the aisle to solve problems and deliver on the issues that make a real difference in our lives. Michiganders are facing the pinch right now, picking up items at the store and then putting them back before checking out, having tough conversations about medical bills, prescription drugs, what paths their kids can afford after high school. We are all concerned about making sure we live in a safe neighborhood and have jobs and businesses in our towns next year and next decade. We might not be able to solve inflation or supply chain issues on our own, but we must work together to lower costs and put Michiganders on a path to a brighter future. As I said in my inaugural address, 
Michiganders compete with an underdog spirit and carry ourselves with a championship swagger. No challenge is too tough for Michigan. No challenge is too tough for Michigan. So tonight, let's talk about what we can do and where we are going together. We are eager to chase our bright future with hustle and grit. Michigan, the state of our state, is strong and ready to go. My proposal tonight will tackle the challenges people are facing right now, make a real difference in their lives, and make Michigan more competitive. This is our future, but policies alone mean nothing. It's about the people they impact. So I'm not going to give you a list. Instead, let's talk about what my proposals will mean to three groups of Michiganders with whom we can all identify. First. Folks working hard to care for themselves and support their family. Second, young people about to graduate. And third, Michiganders born today. The number one issue for folks trying to make ends meet is costs. Michiganders at home, I know how hard you work. I'll get right to the point. Tonight, I'm excited to announce lowering my costs. It's a plan offering immediate relief. It's got three parts. One, let's roll back the retirement tax and save half a million households $1,000 a year. Let's expand the Working Families Tax Credit, delivering at least $3,000 refunds to 700,000 families. And third, pre-K for all, to save families an average of $10,000 a year. I know we might have different perspectives here, but I sure hope we can all get around supporting four-year-olds across Michigan. <laughs> With inflation, every dollar makes a difference. That's why we're moving fast. Parts of the plan have already been introduced by Representatives Whitwer and Shannon and Senators Hertel and McDonald Rivet. Let's get it done. Now let's talk about what lowering my costs means for you. Repealing the retirement tax will make a huge difference for our seniors. Ultimately, it will save 500,000 households an average of 1,000 bucks a year. That's money for prescriptions and groceries and gas or great gifts for your grandkids. Now I fought this tax when I was here as a legislator and as governor because I know it hurts people. We need to get this done for Michiganders like Michael a retired firefighter from Livonia. He, like so many, was aghast when his retirement income was suddenly taxed. He spent his career putting his life on the line to pull his neighbors from burning buildings. And then the state changed the rules in the middle of the game, raising taxes on his hard-earned dollars. Seniors who served, saved, and did everything right deserve to keep more of what they earn. Let's get it done. The 
Working Families Tax Credit, formerly known as the EITC, is a bipartisan tax break at the federal and state level. Boosting it delivers an average refund of at least $3,000 to 700,000 families. As we work together to build a brighter future, we need to lower costs and support every kind of family, those who have kids and those who do not. The Working Families Tax Credit benefits all kinds of families and directly impacts nearly a million Michigan children. That's half the kids in our state. It'll put hundreds of millions back in family budgets and help with rent, school supplies, and food on the table. Data shows boosting the Working Families Tax Credit also closes health and wealth gaps. Children who grow up with this support have better test scores, graduation rates, and earnings as adults. The credit especially benefits single moms and working class families of every race in all 83 counties, from city centers to small towns. In the words of President Ronald Reagan, the best anti-poverty, best pro-family, best job creation measure is what we're calling the Working Families Tax Credit. Let's get it done. So these two tax changes will right a wrong inflicted on Michiganders 12 years ago. In 2011, seniors and hardworking families had the rug ripped out from under them when the retirement tax was enacted and the working families tax credit was gutted. It was wrong. And now we can make it right. Lowering my costs goes further to save people money. So part three, pre-K for all serves families an average of $10,000 savings a year compared to their current pre-K or child care. Every single parent, every one of us knows that an early start is critical to our children's future. That's why we read and talk and sing to our babies. That's why we worry about finding a great child care provider and have wait lists for great preschools. That's why one of us showed up to work just hours after his daughter Violet was born yesterday. Representative Andrews, I hope you are enjoying some well-deserved time with your newborn. Congratulations to you and especially Laura, who did all the heavy lifting on that one. But here's why he showed up to vote, because we know that our work matters. Data shows that children who go to preschool are more likely to graduate, earn a certificate or degree, and get a good paying job. Preschool helps employers too, and that's why so many business groups support it. Unfortunately, affordable preschool is just too hard to get for too many. 20 years ago, it was invaluable for me. Without it, I could not have raised my girls and continued my career. And most of the people in this room could say the same. We were fortunate because we had access and we could afford preschool. Every parent and every child in Michigan deserves the same because we all want what's best for our kids. So let's expand our bipartisan preschool effort, the Great Start Readiness Program, so every four-year-old in Michigan can access a free public preschool education by the end of my second term. This investment will ensure that children arrive at kindergarten ready to learn and it'll save their families upwards of $10,000 a year. 
It helps parents, especially moms, go back to work. And it'll launch hundreds more preschool classrooms across Michigan supporting thousands of jobs. Together, we can lower costs for Michiganders feeling the pain of inflation right now. So for our seniors, for our families, for our children, let's get these measures done. Now, let's turn to the Michiganders who recently graduated from high school or college or a certificate program. I'm looking at my daughters and I'm thinking about all the young people in our state. They're smart. They're engaged. They're fighting for their future. Record turnout on campuses last November proved it. I know that our Secretary of State, Jocelyn Benson, will ensure their votes and the voices of every Michigander are heard and counted in every election. So together, we are going to expand voting rights, protect election workers, and build on last year's bipartisan law to help military members and their families overseas to make sure their votes get counted, too. To keep young Michiganders here and attract even more talent to Michigan, we got to focus on two things, economic opportunity and personal freedom. To deliver on these priorities, I'm excited to announce Make It in Michigan. First, opportunity, a quote from the 90s. It's the economy, stupid. <laughs> Ambitious young people have a lot of options when they graduate. As they decide where they want to live, we must make sure that Michigan is the answer, not just for a few years, but for the rest of their lives, by creating opportunity that lasts for decades. So let's start with the good news. Just over a year ago, in a bipartisan way, we came together to create powerful new tools to attract jobs and investment to Michigan. Since then, we have brought home over $13.5 billion worth of projects, including a chip maker in Bay City, battery plants in Big Rapids, Grand Rapids, Van Buren Township, and big three investments across Michigan. You all know there's a new GM battery plant being built just down the road. Our work is paying off. And as the mayors and county executives here know, when we compete and we win, it is good for everyone in the community. 13,000 good paying jobs secured new jobs. Make It in Michigan proposes a sustainable funding source for our economic development efforts while growing talent, making our communities better places to live, and helping our state become a place where anyone can succeed. If we get this done, we can move faster year-round to compete and win cutting-edge manufacturing projects and bring more supply chains home. We can create opportunity for you and your family and support local economies and small businesses across our state. Businesses know that we must compete to grow, and when we do, we all win. I am proud that we created these powerful economic development tools, and I know we will work together to make them the strongest in our state's history. For too long, we were fighting with one hand tied behind our back, and now Michigan has got the upper hand. Hustling for more projects is a solid first step, but building a strong economy is a marathon, not a sprint. If we want to play in the global market, we must go everywhere and compete 
and win against every one. The good news is competition's in our DNA. Whether it's a local rec league or global manufacturing market, Michiganders hustle. And that spirit can be found in our hungry, passionate young people too. We can channel that energy to shore up Michigan as the world's premier advanced manufacturing destination. The last few years, with economic shocks in China and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, have demonstrated that a domestic supply of chips and energy is tied to national security. And that's why, over the last few weeks, I've met with business leaders around the globe and across our nation, and I told them what Michigan has to offer. Friendly, hardworking people, unbeatable natural resources, a great quality of life at a good cost of living. And most of all, I told them we will do what it takes to bring them to Michigan because our young people deserve the best opportunities in the world right here. To quote our great senior senator, Debbie Stabenow, Michigan makes stuff and we grow stuff. So let's develop that core strength by manufacturing the building blocks of the future right here in Michigan. Let's keep bringing supply chains of cars and chips home to Michigan. And let's increase domestic clean energy production like wind and solar so we can produce more energy in America instead of overseas. <laughs> to help pe young people get jobs, to make stuff and grow stuff, let's support talent development. And let's keep closing in on our 60 by 30 goal to have 60% of people earn a degree or skill certificate by 2030. Let's keep funding the Bipartisan Michigan Achievement Scholarship, which lowers the cost of higher education, community college, private, public, university, by thousands of dollars for most students and makes college tuition free for 65% of graduating seniors. Maybe you can use it too studying engineering at Michigan Tech, nursing at Alpena Community College, teaching at Saginaw Valley, or attend MSU's number one ranked supply chain program. Go green. <laughs> or University of Michigan's number one ranked undergrad business program. <laughs> Rivalries are fun, but we are all on Team Michigan. We got 15 phenomenal universities and community colleges across the state. Let's find apprenticeships and initiatives that are putting nearly 200,000 Michiganders on tuition-free paths to higher education or skills training, helping them land good-paying union jobs. <laughs> and to help even more people make it in Michigan, let's take steps to lower the age for the Michigan Reconnect from 25 to 21. <laughs> Reconnect is our bipartisan program that offers anyone 25 and older, a tuition-free associate's degree or skills training. I want to thank Senator Anthony for her work to establish and grow this program. <laughs> Over 113,000 reconnectors have been accepted, and we want that number to grow. Let's unleash opportunity for our young people while offering companies the skilled, hardworking talent they need to succeed here in Michigan. 
Now, the other half of attracting and retaining young people is standing up for their freedoms. Just a few months ago, Michiganders told us that people should be able to make their own decisions about their own bodies. Let's get to work. Let's repeal our extreme 1931 law ban abortion, banning abortion. And I want to thank I want to thank the Progressive Women's Caucus for their leadership on this issue and Representatives Pohutsky and Senator Geis for introducing legislation to get it done. And while we're at it, let's repeal other dangerous laws prohibiting people from accessing reproductive health care or shaming them for seeking in the first place. Let's repeal outdated laws restricting who you can marry. And let's expand Elliot Larson Civil Rights Act. Let's expand the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act so you can't be fired or evicted for who you are or how you identify or who you love. That's your business. <laughs> so I called for this back in my first day of the state back in 2019, and I want to thank Senator Moss and Representative Hoskins for introducing the bill. Let's get it done. <laughs> Protecting these freedoms is the right thing to do. And it's just good economics. States with extreme laws are losing talent and investment because you know what? Bigotry is bad for business. Anyone who knows the history of the state of Michigan knows we should build our reputation as a welcoming beacon of opportunity where anyone can succeed. I know talent development is a personal priority for my partner, Lieutenant Governor Gilchrist, and I'm so excited about continuing the work with him so we can help people see their futures in Michigan. I've also heard from folks like a woman named Lauren. Lauren grew up in Traverse City. She wants to move home. She wants to come back to Michigan and start a family. But she waited until she knew her reproductive rights would be protected. Lauren, I want you and anyone who lives in a state that wants to control your body or deny your existence to know that Michigan has a place for you. So together, we're going to change Michigan from a state with century-old bans to forward-looking protections. Our message is simple. We will fight for your freedom. And you know what? Let's go on offense. I'll go to any state that restricts people's freedoms and win business and hardworking people from them. I'm looking at you, Ohio and Indiana.
All right, I figured Ohio shade would get everyone up. <laughs> Every parent, Republican, Democrat, Independent, we want our kids to stay in Michigan. Let's give them reasons to stay beyond the promise of a home-cooked meal or free laundry facilities. Yes, I'm talking from the first person here. Let's expand economic opportunity and protect fundamental freedoms. And now that we've talked about folks who are working to make ends meet and young people who are choosing where to build their lives, I want to talk about the littlest Michiganders. A baby born down the street at Sparrow today could live past the year 2100. Little Violet, who was born yesterday. What will they see in that time? More Stanley Cup wins for the Wings? A Super Bowl for the Lions? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> all right, come on, I know, come on. <laughs> A World Series for the Tigers. <laughs> hey, we can dream. The one thing I do know about 2100. Tom Izzo is still going to be coaching at MSU. <laughs> the truth is, we have no idea what kids born today will live through. Heck, when I was here three years ago, we had no idea what we were about to live through. But what we do know is that we can act now to set them up for success. A lot's going to change by the year 2100. But what children need to succeed will not. Today I'm proposing bold investments in public safety and education to make sure that a child born today lives in a safe neighborhood and can get a great public education. Over the last four years, we made record investments in our children and schools by leading with our shared values. We closed the funding gap between schools and brought student investment to an all-time high four years in a row without raising taxes. We made a generational investment to build new libraries and labs and improve air in classrooms and water from drinking fountains. We funded mental health and campus safety at record levels. We set up fellowships and started paying our student teachers. Student teacher stipends are making a difference. <laughs> student teacher stipends are already making a difference for future educators like Zahara from Canton. She uses the money to pay her bills as she gears up to enter the classroom. Zahara, we are rooting for you, and we will continue having your back. We'll continue this work so every classroom has a caring, qualified educator. In the months ahead, we'll deliver another strong education budget, but we must do more. Let's fund My Kids Back on Track and offer every child personalized learning support to get them back on track for long-term success. I want to thank Representative Hodzma for championing this issue. When a child gets a great start and learns to read and graduates high school, there he is. <laughs> Our representative thank you but when when we invest in an early start and a child learns to read and graduates high school they're on track to land a good paying job or pursue higher education unfortunately the last few years have disrupted regular learning patterns in class instruction alone is not enough our children need more support to master the skills we know they need most investing in tutoring after-school programs and other learning supports gets children the one-on-one -on -one time they need with a caring, qualified educator so that they can be successful. 
Whether you're a third grader learning about the solar system, a sixth grader focusing on fractions, or a junior sharpening your persuasive writing skills, tutoring addresses your specific learning challenges. Now we know that education investments matter to the private sector too. Employers know that today's students are tomorrow's workforce and entrepreneurs. We need tutoring to get our kids back on track for Michigan's long-term economic success. Let's fund my kids back on track before spring break. Now let's talk about public safety. As a former prosecutor, public safety is a top priority for me. I will work hard to make sure everyone can get home at the end of the day. And I am proud to have a strong partner in our Attorney General, Dana Nessel. She and her great team at the AG's office prosecute violent criminals, they're shoring up consumer protections, and facing down anyone who tries to harm Michiganders. Thank you. Since I've been governor, we've invested a billion dollars in public safety. Let's continue funding law enforcement with better training, oversight, and access to mental health resources. Police officers, state troopers, and prosecutors, they got tough, dangerous jobs. If we work together, we can get them what they need to keep our communities safe. And right now, there is a flood of illegal guns on our street. There's been a rise of break-ins at gun dealerships and straw purchases. That's where one person illegally buys a firearm for another. Firearms are getting more dangerous, too. Thanks to 3D printed technology called Glock switches that turn semi-automatic weapons fully automatic. That's why we launched Operation Safe Neighborhoods, taking hundreds of illegal firearms off the street before they could be used in the commission of a crime. But we must do more. So the world our kids inherit is not more violent than the one we inhabit now. The time for only thoughts and prayers is over. It's time for common sense action to reduce gun violence in our communities. Let's enact universal background checks for people who want to buy firearms. Let's enact safe storage laws so we can make sure firearms are stored safely at home. And let's enact extreme risk protection orders so we can keep guns out of the hands of those who might represent a danger to themselves or others. If Florida and Indiana can get this done, we sure as heck can, right? Despite pleas from Oxford families, these issues never even got a hearing in the last legislature. This year, let's change that. Let's work together to stop the violence and to save lives. I want to thank Senator Baer and Representative Brabeck for their leadership on this issue. I want to be very clear, 
I'm not talking about law-abiding citizens. Hunters and responsible gun owners from both sides of the aisle know we need to get these common sense safety proposals across the finish line. We need to do this for our kids, like Zaire from Plymouth. Zaire wrote to me and said that he just wants to feel safe going to school. Zaire, we will get this done so you and your classmates can focus on learning and growing. Tonight, I spoke to three groups of Michiganders we can all see ourselves in. I propose that we lower my costs, we make it in Michigan, and fund public safety and education. There are many more priorities I will share in my budget proposal in two weeks. But I want to highlight two more tonight that impact us all, infrastructure and climate. Now, if you just moved to Michigan or you've been living under a rock, you might not know roads are pretty important to me and to the people of Michigan. Our state flower might as well be an orange barrel. Since I took office, we fixed 16,000 lane miles, 1,200 bridges, and we supported 89,000 good paying jobs in the process. Throughout my second term, we will continue finding ways to keep fixing the damn roads. And as we fix them, Let's build the most innovative transportation systems in the country with new, smart road technology. With new, smart road technology, we can avert hundreds of crashes and get the next generation of Michigan-made vehicles on the road. We also have billions in federal resources from the bipartisan infrastructure law headed our way. To invest them as efficiently as possible, I established the Michigan Infrastructure Office. This year, it will redouble its efforts helping to build up every kind of infrastructure, roads, high-speed internet, clean energy, and lead-free pipes. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, it's our shared duty to face climate change head on and protect our land and our water. We must, we must pursue climate action while creating jobs, lowering costs, and becoming a hub of clean energy production. Last year, thank you, Abe. Last year, we unveiled the My Healthy Climate Plan, and this year, we should make bold investments in climate action to deliver on our targets. Let's get it done. I am honored, I am truly honored to be standing here as your governor. And I will work with anyone who's serious about solving problems so we can move our state forward. Before I go, I want to talk about an American superpower, belief. I've always been a hopeful person. I believe in our bright future. I write in my gratitude journal every day and insist on quoting Ted Lasso much to my staff's chagrin and occasional delight. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I am not naive. Over the last four years, we have faced historic challenges and seen the visceral consequences of political division. The prevailing take now seems to be that things will get worse, and fatalism is in vogue as people wonder aloud whether America's best days are behind her. I reject that. We cannot mistake pessimism for intelligence, and we must never forget who we are. 
My fellow Michiganders, we live in a special place. Our beautiful state has played host to so much progress because of our unbreakable, hopeful spirit. As the world grapples with big challenges and asks itself tough questions, our responsibility as Michiganders is to roll up our sleeves and do the work. On May 31st, 1907, that's exactly what President Teddy Roosevelt reminded us at a speech just down the road at Michigan Agricultural College, known as MSU today. I think Tom Izzo was coaching then too. <laughs> President Roosevelt said, I believe in the happiness that comes from the performance of duty, not the avoidance of duty. But I also believe in trying, each of us, as strength is given us, to bear one another's burdens. Michigan, let's embrace our duty. Let's show everyone that the cure for cynicism is competence. Let's lead by example as a state of hardworking, happy warriors. As Coach Campbell said, we know what we are. So whether it's your buffs or the map decal on your car or your grit hat, let's show the world we are Michiganders and nothing's going to get in our way. Thank you. Let's have a productive term. Drive safely and good night. And that was Governor Gretchen Whitmer as she just delivered her 2023 State of the State Address live from the Capitol Building there in Lansing. Once again, Phil Panarski here with the Wood TV Live Desk. Thank you, everybody who has decided to tune in to this address, yes, watching us we'll the on both the Wood chamber. TV, uh, on our website, woodtv.com, as well as on WXSP and across the country on our social media channels. Again, uh, the governor touched on quite a bit of things. She touched on inflation, of course, uh, gun reform, and climate change. She even made a few quips about uh, regarding gun reform and inflation, saying that there are several plans that she would like to see passed and coming on and coming going over the next couple of days, and we are going to be expecting a lot more conversations regarding the governor's address over the next coming days. And I would like to remind everybody that political reporter Rick Alban, I know we tried to hear from what he had to say yesterday about what to expect, but he will actually be here on the live desk joining me tomorrow to discuss the governor's address and talk about what we can expect to see over the coming days as well. So again, that's coming up, and he is also going to be delivering a lot of information from Lansing. He is there live right now uh, on WXSP starting at 10 p.m. on our newscast as well as Wood TV at 11. And as I mentioned, he will be on the live desk tomorrow as well and across all of our newscasts as he again will be breaking down more in depth what we just heard from Governor Whitmer and we will also have continuing coverage on our website woodtv.com that is where you can find a full replay of this address as well as so much more coverage again what we heard from Rick yesterday is also there and you can check that out for yourself and we as we have just heard from Governor Whitmer, we have actually a response. It is a pre-recorded response from the Republican Party. We are now going to send it to you now so you can watch it. It is from Republican Party leader Senator Eric Nesbitt. He is going to give the Republican response to Governor Whitmer's address, and we will send you there live now. Hi, I'm Eric Nesbitt, Senate Republican leader. Governor Whitmer just spoke to you from the Capitol building. It's a beautiful setting and a building we should all be proud of. It's a long way from here. 
this is where our focus needs to be right now because far too many Michiganders are struggling to afford everyday necessities. By now, you know the numbers because you see them every time you visit the grocery store. Your cereal and the milk you pour onto it costs more. Your bread and the butter you spread on it costs more. Your meat and your potatoes, your coffee and your creamer, your bacon and of course your eggs, $5 a dozen. This has been going on for over a year now. And every single day of that year, there have been Michiganders, our neighbors, our friends, sometimes our own family members who have had to choose between buying the food they need for their families and heating their homes or paying their rent or making their car payment. Governor Whitmer had multiple opportunities to provide you with real relief, to put more money, your money, back in your pocket. But she failed you by vetoing each proposal that was sent to her. She failed the new parents who needed a little extra help buying diapers and baby food. She failed the family already struggling to send their daughter off to college. She failed the retired couple who just wanted to buy Christmas presents for their grandkids. This is a fundamental difference between Republicans and Democrats. In this time of economic turmoil, Senate and House Republicans believe you know how best to spend your money. The governor and Democrats believe it is they who know how to spend your money best. Republicans want to take the governor's claim that she is finally ready to lower taxes seriously, but actions speak louder than words. And for the past four years, her actions have been of someone who wants to take money out of your pocket, not put any money back in. Remember, she began her tenure as governor by proposing a gas tax increase of 45 cents per gallon and increasing taxes on small businesses by 40%. The governor says all the right things about working across the aisle, but the truth is that she set a record during her first term for vetoing bills, many which Republicans and Democrats worked together to pass. More vetoes than Governor Engler, Governor Snyder, or even Governor Granholm. House and Senate Republicans will continue to try to work with the governor where we can, because that's what you expect us to do. It's what you need us to do. We will not give up our efforts to promote the rights of parents, to improve the reading and math scores of our children, to make our neighborhoods safer and our economy stronger, and to give families relief from record high prices, not by growing government, but by letting you keep more of what you have earned. But to do so, Michiganders desperately need their governor's actions to finally match her words. Relief is needed now, not some phased in plan that eventually provides relief four years from now as the governor and the Democrats have proposed. Because only together can we finally provide immediate relief now to working families and seniors on a fixed income, struggling to afford day-to-day -day life in this great state. Thank you for listening. God bless you and God bless the state of Michigan. Good night. And that was State Senator Eric Nesbitt. He re, uh, relayed the Republican response to Governor Whitmer's uh, 2023 State of the State Address, which you just heard live right here on the Wood TV Live Desk and across the state on our social media channels and WXSP as well. Some of the main takeaways from Nesbitt's response include saying that he believes the party, the Republican Party, might be willing to work with the governor to get certain legislation passed over the next term, but that he also said that he was pretty skeptical whether or not the governor would be willing to do the same, although the governor did make a lot of mention of bipartisanship during her address, in case you did. Uh, but of course, you know, there's going to be a lot of conversation regarding the address and what's going to be happening over the next couple of days, couple of weeks, couple of months, really, as we continue out throughout this term uh, with Democrats having a majority in the uh, uh, state Senate and House of Representatives. So a lot of conversation needed to is going to need to be had, and we are actually very lucky to have our political reporter Rick Albin here with us. He is going to be joining us all throughout tonight on our newscast, and he'll be joining me here on the live desk tomorrow to really break down what we can expect over the next couple of weeks and really talk about what the governor had to say in her fifth 
State of the State Address. And again, that is probably going to wrap it up for us here tonight. Again, we're going to have continuing coverage on all of our newscasts tonight and into the morning. And you can also find all of the latest information regarding the State of the State Address right now over on our website, woodtv.com. And again, I do want to thank everybody for tuning into this latest edition of the Wood TV Live Desk. I'm Phil Panarski, and we hope you have a great rest of your night, and we hope you join us tomorrow.